that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at His feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame Now robed in majesty The radiance of perfect love Now shines for all to see Your name, your name is victory and all praise will rise to Christ our King your name your name is victory and all praise will rise to Christ our King Resurrecting me in your name 
What an incredible time of worship. I am so glad that we are able to join together in worship one final time as we end 2020. We're going to continue uh, in just a moment with our teaching in Kingdom Come, the series that we're in with a message called Abnormal Response. Join in with us. Take some notes, or better yet, as you follow along in the message, type things in chat and respond, and let us know that you're joining us. Lastly, we're going to continue worshiping through giving now. And let me just tell you, thank you so much for your generosity in 2020. Now let's finish the year strong as the Bay Church. If 2020 has been a normal year of income and resources for you, or maybe uh, one that's been above and beyond what you were expecting, please finish with a full tithe by December 31st and add an extra offering at year end over and above the tithe to make sure that we can fully resource all the biblical core priorities of the Bay Church. Also, I want to add this, that if 2020 has not been a great year for you uh, resource wise, let me just be the first to tell you, feel no guilt, no shame. In fact, if you hear anything from your servant leaders and your team of pastors, know this, that we have nothing but grace and compassion for you. And please let us know how we can serve you in the coming days ahead. Now, this is the last weekend gathering for 2020, the last opportunity to give. So there are four ways that you can give. Number one, you can click on the menu in the upper right hand side or mobile users on the left or go to the bay.church forward slash give to give digitally. Secondly, you can uh, give to the number on the screen. Just send a text message with the amount you want to give to the number on the screen. We'll leave it up here for a moment. And thirdly, you can mail in your check. Now, understand that if you want tax deductible receipt in 2020, it must be postmarked by December 31st. Lastly, you can give in person at the Bay Church. Being that this is the last week to give in 2020, we have special office hours. That's gonna be this coming week, Monday through Wednesday from 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And then on New Year's Eve from noon to five. That's Thursday from noon until five. You can drop your giving off at the church. Again, God bless you as you give. Thank you so much for your generosity. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for what you're doing in and through the Bay Church, what you have in 2020. We look forward to what you're calling us to reach the 75% that don't know Christ yet, to mature the 25% that already know you and have a personal relationship. God, I pray that you give us hearts of generosity, that we would be able to impact all those lives around us in Jesus' name, amen.
Let your love rise above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadow In my weakness your glory appears I'm not enough Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are, will you meet me here again? I'm not enough, unless you Welcome to week number 10, our series, Kingdom Come, and we are having the opportunity to hear from the greatest teacher ever to teach on the greatest sermon ever given, and no, that's not me by any stretch of the imagination, that is Jesus. And that's what this whole series is about, uh, Kingdom Come, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm very excited to be able to kind of dive right on in, and as we do that, this uh, teaching this week, the topic is actually a really difficult one. And I want to start by saying I definitely don't have this mastered. Uh, I'm in process like all of you as we kind of navigate our journey with Jesus and try to discover what it looks like to honor him in the way we conduct our lives. 
And as we go through this topic, it's kind of funny, I almost wonder if I wasn't fully paying attention in our team teaching uh, when we were going through topics, because the last couple that have been given to me have been some real uh, difficult passages. And as I mentioned a while back when I taught, I can really relate with the quote by Mark Twain who said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me, it's the parts that I do understand. And, and I can really uh, sense that uh, in my own life as I navigate through these complexities of Scripture. And as we go to share today, I hope that you'll be challenged and encouraged, too, uh, with what Jesus talks about. The title of our teaching is actually Abnormal Response. And the question I want to ask is, have you ever been somewhere and maybe seen or experienced uh, something very uh, abnormal in the way somebody responded to something? Uh, I think this is actually what fascinates us with things like YouTube videos, uh, when the response is not what we anticipated or what happens as a result of someone doing something is unexpected. I think this is what endears us to movies and stories of people is when there is an abnormal response, something that we're not used to. I mean, nothing bothers me more than watching a TV show or a movie, and I can tell you exactly what's going to happen by the end uh, because it just it loses a lot of that sense of, wow. Um, I know in my own life, I had an abnormal moment of how I responded. It was actually, I'd been a Christ follower for a little while. Uh, I was still playing soccer. I was in college and I was actually uh, in a game and I'd been trying really hard working on letting my speech reflect my uh, belief in Jesus because in the past on the soccer field, if I got fouled a certain way, something didn't go my way, I often would have words come out of my mouth that didn't honor God. And I remember being in this match, and this kid uh, put his cleat right into my chest. I was a goalkeeper, landed right into me, created these big marks. It was very painful. And in the past where I would have normally yelled at you, you some profanity, I said, ow, that hurt, which is a very abnormal response in a game. And literally people around were like, what did he just say? That's kind of weird. Uh, okay. And they just, they, everybody paused and kind of some people laughed. They were, you know, what, what is going on with this guy? And it was good for me because it showed me that there was an abnormal response that God had been doing something on the inside of my heart. On an even more serious note, I remember hearing a story back in 2006 that was a complete abnormal response that really impacted my whole world. Um, you may be familiar with it. It was back in 2006 where there was a Quaker community. And in this Quaker community in Pennsylvania, uh, a armed man came into a one school, uh, one room schoolhouse and shot 10 beautiful little girls who were in the middle of their education. And five of those girls passed away. I never been horrified by hearing the story. And then the gunman turned and he committed suicide. And that's not what was the abnormal response that shocked me. I mean, that part shocked me enough. But what was really powerful was that I heard through news stories later that the Quaker family donated money. The, the families of these individuals who lost their daughters uh, donated money to the killer's widow and his three surviving children. Uh, they openly went to the funeral of this man who had uh, committed these atrocities against their daughters. And they openly went and they, they told him they forgave them. Uh, it was reported they were hugging the widow of this man who killed their daughters and, and his children, uh, that they were hugging family members and they were there to console and to help them. They set up a fund for them uh, to help their family in a difficult time of need. And I was blown away because I thought, man, uh, these Quakers have a deep faith in Jesus. We know that by their beliefs. But to see it exemplified, to see it demonstrated in this way was really powerful. It really caught my attention. It it challenged the way that I looked at situation. I thought, man, this this is... This is just, this was unbelievable what these people participated in and how they responded. It was really, uh, really beautiful. And when I read that, uh, I thought, man, that's an abnormal response. And I also had to ask myself, would I be able to respond the same way this beautiful community responded? Uh, would I be able to, to, to do what they did and what caught my attention also caught the world's attention because people were like, well, how could they do that? They just got done burying their own girls and now they're helping the woman and her children of the man who, who committed this atrocity. And it was kind of like, how can this be? And, and I think the reason it was so powerful is because it was an act of beautiful mercy, an act of forgiveness. It was an act of love and it was contrary to what we know. And uh, you may be watching this teaching right now as someone who's not a believer or somebody who's kind of 
uh, pursuing or looking at the claims of Jesus. And I'll tell you, it may the things we're going to talk about may seem a little bit strange. It may seem a little bit like, man, I, I don't know if I could do that. I was never taught that way. Or, you know, my parents never raised me that way. I was kind of taught it was tit for tat. And if you hurt somebody hurt you, you hurt them back or you get revenge and, and you don't let people mess with you. And that's just how it's supposed to be. And But I really do believe that Jesus shows us this beautiful kind of third way in our teaching that we're going to discover where he says it's not about uh, getting even. It's not about... Uh, you know, going after making someone hurt. It's also not about complete passivity where you don't do anything ever and you just sit back and you're a victim of everything. No, but there's there's this beautiful balance. And so today in the passage we're going to study, uh, we're going to explore this unique kind of abnormal response that Jesus calls us to. So if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you or you version app to turn to Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 38 through 42. And we're going to read about uh, Jesus and this kind of abnormal response he calls us to as followers of Christ. The interesting part is here is that this is the fifth statement of six statements that Jesus makes uh, that come directly after his teaching about uh, that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. And so as we dive into this, you're going to see this language of you've heard it said uh, to you of old, but I say to you, uh, and it's mixed in a variety of ways to start the passage. You're going to hear about this. And so far, we've talked about uh, five, uh, four of the statements. We've talked about anger. We've talked about Jesus' uh, way of looking at lust, divorce, oaths, and this one's now about retaliation. And in a week or so, we're going to be talking about what it means to love your enemies. And the beautiful thing is that these things that Jesus is bringing up really deal with uh, you and I and our horizontal relationship with people and how that does affect our vertical relationship with God. So here Jesus is saying to his early followers, uh, listen, that uh, as you've understood the law, as you've, in this case, especially the law of kind of retaliation we're going to talk about, that you have a limited view or interpretation, Jesus says. What, what I'd always intended from the beginning was for this to be a heart issue and the command of God for his creation to flourish is really what this is all about. And so Jesus is not turning up the volume on the laws that he's uh, have been listed in the Old Testament. He's not turning down the volume. He's really saying, hey, this is actually what I really desired from the beginning. I've given you some provisions, but I've desired this specific way of looking at life. And so these statements are going to challenge us. So turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42. And it says as follows. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your outer tunic, essentially, let him then also have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. This is pretty powerful. You talk about an abnormal response. And as we dive into it, uh, first of all, I want you to understand Jesus is a realist who knows that the world is evil due to sin. He knows there's evil people out there. He recognizes that. Uh, He has a faith that humans can change through him. Uh, He also uh, humanizes the haters and their hatred. He he, he calls out some behavior that's not great or right. Uh, And he also calls us to imitate how he responded in similar type of situations. Jesus knows that this abnormal response is a battle worth fighting for. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was actually killed uh, by Nazis during World War II, he, he put it this way about this passage. He says, Only those whose theirs is the cross of Jesus find faith in the victory over evil and can obey this command. So as we go into this, there's this understanding that that for us to really obey this, we have to understand who Jesus is and what he is doing in our life. And we're going to talk a little bit about how Jesus also chose to respond to things that he mentions in this passage. So let's start by saying what's going on here in verse 38. He says, you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. You've probably heard this statement at some point uh, in your life. Uh, What he's referring to is called the lex talionis, and it means the law of retaliation. There's three main passages in scripture that deal with this. The first one's Exodus chapter 21, verse 23 through 25, where it says, But if there is harm, then you shall repay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And then Leviticus 24, 19 through 20 says, If anyone injures his neighbor and has done, done it, uh, shall be done to him. 
fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. And last but not least, Deuteronomy 19, 21, and there's other verses, but these are the main ones, says, your eye shall not pity, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So, so why did they have these kind of uh, laws of retaliation, of retribution? The purpose of these was just retribution. But retribution is limited. Not, it's only equal to the original injury. Uh, the principle is equal retribution was uh, better than uh, you know crazy violence that just continued to escalate out of control. Yet in the midst of this kind of revolutionary law that was very helpful for many believers, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to take it a step further. Scott McKnight, the theologian, put it this way. Instead of the requirement of retribution, like you have to do this back, Jesus reveals that grace, love, and forgiveness can reverse the dangers of retribution and even more create an alternative society, one that's of love, of peace, that helps people to see a third way or a different option. So Jesus really flips the script and says, hey, I want to show you another way. So much so that he says in verse 39, but I say to you, do not resist the one who's evil. Uh, Jesus is not saying that this is in most cases with people who are reasonable and people who know God and are just, you know, they're just a little bit confused. Yeah, that can happen. But really here he's saying, you know, people who are evil, they're wicked, they're bad. They're, they're not followers of God. They don't have good intent. They, they, they want to cause pain or difficulty either because they've been through pain, because hurt people hurt people. We're not sure. But no matter what the fact is, these are not great, kind people. And so he points to his Jesus followers. He's saying, listen, we need to treat people who are evil uh, in a non-violent uh, way, in a life-transforming, loving way that's contrary to how the world would typically respond. So how do we engage generously with evil or unreasonable people? First thing I want to mention that some of you may be thinking is, listen, it doesn't mean that we don't have a holy discontent or an anger when people are being unjustly treated. It, it's not really even talking about that. Uh, obviously, if you see a child being harmed or your spouse is being hurt, yes, yeah, step in and uh, act justly and protect and, and help and love. That's part of our job as men and women of God uh, in, the, in the church and in our community. But he's speaking less here about others and their offense and more about our, our offense. Uh, how has someone treated me? What has someone asked me to do? How am I personally like standing up and saying, you better do this for me and you better treat me this way? It's more about the individual situations that you and I face and how we choose to respond to those situations is really what he wants to get our attention with. And he does this in an interesting way that you see a lot in um, by, by Hebrew authors and by biblical authors, where he says, hey, I'm going to give you three examples, and then I'm going to hit you with one power-packed fourth one to really help encapsulate everything I'm saying here. And that's what Jesus does. He gives us these three kind of uh, examples or little sketches that are point to point you and I to a a larger principle to help us with our life. And so if you don't get anything else from this teaching, my challenge to you would be this principle simply, respond with Jesus in mind. Maybe you've heard the old saying, you know, what would Jesus do? It's kind of like a remake of that. It's saying, hey, respond with Jesus in mind. How would Jesus want you and I to respond to these situations? We're gonna look at what, what he did in similar situations, this passage is, but respond with Jesus in mind. So the first instance he gives us is the slap. It says in Matthew 539 regarding the slap. It says, but I say to you, Jesus says, do not resist one who's evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. What's going on here is he's saying, you know, that, that would be an incredible insult. It'd be like someone flipping you off today. Um, and you just saying, hey, okay, go ahead and flip me off again. That's fine. Or, you know, go ahead and insult me again. Hey, I get it. It's almost a comical picture, Jesus says, of, hey, you've already been slapped, so now tell him, okay, well, if you're really needing to deal with this anger issue, you really need to take these, here's, here's my other cheek as well. Talk about uh, an abnormal response. Talk about somebody going, well, well no, I don't, I, I don't need to do that. And can you imagine how someone would respond? It'd be like if you're on Highway 4 and somebody cut you off, which happens all the time, they flipped you the bird and said, you know, and, and you, instead of flipping that bird back, just said, hi, you know, just kind of waved and said, I'm going to pray for you. And and you you invited them, even being upset, and you just say, hey, I, I'm going to deal with this. I'll be okay. Uh, an abnormal response, a different way of dealing with it. I think of a time where I received a really uh, nasty um, email about uh, myself and a bunch of things, and it was really kind of uh, strange because it kind of came out of nowhere. And 
And I remember at first my normal response would be, well, I'm going to get them back, you know, that tit for tat. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hit them as hard as they hit me. And, but God really calmed my spirit in that moment and said, Jason, I, I don't want you to respond like this. This, is, this, this person's hurting. And I remember responding back, uh, hey, I, I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm really sorry, but, uh, could, you know, could we talk? Are you doing okay? Uh, how are you right now? And I saw how God did a beautiful restoration in that relationship and worked because in that moment, which I've not been great at always doing, I had an abnormal or a different response. N.T. Wright puts it this way when he says, the shocking thing about this passage in the Sermon on the Mount is that we are told to watch what our Heavenly Father is doing and then do the same ourselves. Jesus gives us a beautiful example. He says, you know, if you've been slapped on one cheek, turn the other also. Isaiah 50, verse 6 and 7, speaking of the Messiah, almost 700 years or more before Jesus came to the earth, uh, fully God, fully man, in the form of a baby, which he just got done celebrating for Christmas. It says these words in Isaiah 50, verse 6 and 7, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I hid not my face from the disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been discharged or disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. And then we see in Matthew 26, uh, verse 67, it says that then they spit on his face and they struck Jesus and someone slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? You see, Jesus himself, as he talks about this passage, knew that he would then later act out the very principle he asked. He was slapped. He was beaten for us. Yet he didn't resist, and he showed the love of God. It reminds me of guys like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who chose a path of nonviolence. They they still resisted. They still went against the grain, but they chose a path of nonviolence that was an abnormal response than what the culture was used to. And I believe, as a result, really did begin to bring some significant changes in that period in our nation because of his commitment to it, where there was others who were more committed to, to violent acts back. And, and honestly, that's kind of the way of the world, so you can't blame them, but it wasn't as effective in bringing change. And I think it's a powerful thing for us to understand. Jesus is asking for us to have a very abnormal response, and he's challenging us. Will you respond with Jesus in mind? Will you and I respond with him in mind? It's a great quote by Scott McKnight where he says, there is no way around what Jesus is saying in our text. Jesus overtly ends the Mosaic command to show no pity, and in the appropriation of the law of retaliation, in its place, he orders his followers, you and me, to be merciful. Jesus' words take the law of retaliation to a different place. The law was concerned with the requirement of equal retribution, while Jesus undermines that requirement and reshapes how his followers are to respond to perpetrators or evil people. And it causes me to ask the question, I want to ask you as well, as we approach 2021, how could we respond differently to those that come against us? How could we respond differently? Then he gives us a second instance of being sued. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. The thing that's interesting about this is that the cloak, this 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 uh, garment, this outer garment that would be used, was considered the inalienable possession of people. Everyone had the right to that. No one had the right to sue or to take that cloak. And Jesus is saying, "Hey, don't just give them your tunic if they're suing you. Give them their cloak as well." Uh, basically, you'd be standing almost naked before this person, and you would be exposing their greed and exposing. Uh, they're, they're kind of shaming them by showing your shame and your vulnerability that, hey, listen, I'm innocent of this and, and you may want to take this from me. I'm just going to give you everything to show how ridiculous this whole situation is. And really what Jesus is kind of saying here is uh, that essentially we should shame the greed of others by acting generous towards the greedy. What does it do? It then exposes the reality of what's really going on in the situation. And it's an abnormal response for sure. It's not an easy response but it's one that, that changes things. Um, people who are greedy and power hungry need to see demonstrations that, of love in lives that revolve around a different uh, truth, a different principle, a, a center that can't be bought, a center that's based around a personal relationship with Jesus and not necessarily around possessions or my home and the stuff that I have. It's a different way of living and it's a very convicting thing when someone encounters that who has a completely different mindset or philosophy that's based around material possessions alone. 
think about Jesus. Jesus was wrongfully convicted as an innocent man. He was stripped of his clothes. He was beaten and he was murdered. His garments were taken and literally cast up. It says in Matthew 27, 35, and when they had crucified Jesus, they divided his garments among them by casting lots for his clothes, gambling for his clothes. So th this challenges me when people uh, legally or personally attack me. How might Jesus want me to respond? What can I do to elicit an abnormal response that honors him, uh, that puts Jesus in mind in the situation? How could I respond in a way that would expose the greediness, but at the same time would hopefully change the heart of the person that's walking in this wicked behavior? Uh, that's why we're called to respond with Jesus in mind, because he's saying, I can do a different work in your heart and in their heart if you choose to respond in a way that's not normative. Uh, it's challenging and convicting, but not normative. Thirdly, he gives us the instance of forced to carry. And if anyone forced you to go one mile, go with him too. What's it referring to? A Roman soldier could require any citizen of that time to help them carry their equipment for up to a mile. And that would not be a fun thing because it'd be heavy packs and armor and swords and but the law was very clear that it restricted them from making them carry it any further. So Jesus said, hey, you know what? Uh, if they make you carry this stuff a mile, these Romans who you don't like, who have you oppressed in occupation, who, who are in your country, who you don't want to be here, who are hoping the Messiah will overthrow, uh, go a step further and go two miles. What? That, that'd be an abnormal response. That They'd probably be like, well, no, no, you can't carry my stuff anymore. And it would elicit a lot of questions like, why are you doing this? And, and, and why are you helping me when you don't have to anymore? And, and, and what's the purpose? And it actually opens up an opportunity to hopefully impact the heart of the person who is evil, who is requiring this of you. Uh, and Jesus is saying, hey, I want you to turn the tables. I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to try to hurt them. I want you to follow my example, Jesus says. And, and let's see what God will do in that as a result. You may say, well, Jason, does this really work? Jesus believed it worked in so much so that the early authors of the New Testament also followed suit with their words. It says this words in Romans chapter 12, verse 17 through 21, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome evil. Um, do not do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And you're like, oh, finally, a good verse. Like if I'm kind and I do this, it's going to be like burning coals in their head. They're really going to get it finally. Well, no. In most cultures, it's actually the opposite of that. In most cultures, if you carried a bowl of hot coals on your head, it was a sign of repentance. So what the author is saying here in Romans is that, hey, if if you are kind and you don't repay evil for evil, but repay it with good, what's going to happen is that they're going to be convicted. The Spirit of God is going to work in their life, and they're going to be repentant, and their life is going to be changed. Uh, and so there's this beautiful thing that happens. So when people you and I don't like, people who frustrate us or burden us, uh, when they when we encounter them and they're they're putting things on us, how could we turn that burden into a blessing? How could we uh, take it a step further? Maybe your boss is asking you to do something, and you're like, "Man, I don't want to do this. This is yeah, it is required. You can't ask it of me." But maybe you take it a step further and you go beyond that and you bless them, even though you don't have to. And as a result, maybe it opens up a door where maybe there's been some wickedness or some not some great behavior for you to share about who God is. Uh, what might happen if you and I chose to respond with an abnormal way that could potentially point people to Jesus? I remember a student one time who was really difficult in youth ministry years ago, and they were hard and they were rude to me and rude to other people. And one day I just stopped them and they had done something and they deserved to be kicked out. And I just said, um, you know, they th probably thought I was going to kick them out. And I just said, hey, look at me. Um, how would you like to go get some coffee and just talk? And it was interesting because it was completely abnormal response, but they broke down. And I had to, ended up taking them to coffee, sharing life with them, hearing their hurts and pains. And they actually became a great student in the ministry. Um, there was just a lot of hurt going on there, a lot of wickedness, a lot of difficulty. And they didn't know how to process. And the abnormal response triggered something new. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it this way, evil will become powerless when it finds no opposing object, no resistance, but instead is willingly born and suffered. Evil meets an opponent for which it has no match. Think of Jesus uh, in this regard. Uh, we talk about carrying something. Jesus was made to carry a heavy cross at the hands of the Romans. 
and not just a cross, but a cross that would lead to his death. And Jesus was innocent. He didn't have, he shouldn't have been carrying this cross at all. Yet, how did he respond? He responded with grace and humility and, and abundant mercy. Scott McKnight puts it this way, those who love will even love those who dish out injustice. A person shaped by the Jesus creed responds with injustice, not with retaliation and vengeance, but with grace, compassion, and abundant mercy in such a way that it reverses injustice altogether. Respond with Jesus in mind. So, you know, you just got done shopping. Maybe someone took the last toy or maybe you're going to go return some stuff this week and somebody grabs the last item and you're like, man, I want to lash out. I want to hit him with that toy. I want to throw him down the aisle. And I've seen horrible videos of this over the last few weeks with Christmas shopping. But instead, maybe God would say, hey, even offer to pay for that gift that they just took underneath your nose. What kind of response would that elicit? How would that abnormal response to them change the situation. Someone takes up two spot parking spots instead of getting mad and wanting to go key their car. Maybe you do something different and you you bless them with a note just saying they have a hope they have a great day instead of something wicked or evil. Respond with Jesus in mind. The fourth thing he gives us is kind of the whammy principle. And it says in the instance for this principle uh, is this Matthew 5 42 give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Jesus said, hey, I gave you a bunch of really hard examples, really difficult things you can respond to differently, but ultimately give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. He's saying walk in generosity. So the challenge to you and I as we enter this new year of 2021 is, will you and I be known as people of generosity, outlandish, crazy people of generosity? I've been processing this a lot and it's it's tough, but will I be known for my generosity? Will I give of my time and my ability, my talents, my financial resources to make a difference in the church, in the community, in my neighborhood, in people around me? When it's within my power to help another, will I do so? Or will I hold on to the things of this world? Because here's the truth. We can either hold on to the things of this world or we can hold on to the kingdom of heaven. We can't hold on to both. We don't have that option. So as we're past the holidays and Christmas has been wrapped up and we're trying to figure out how to live our lives. Will we look for ways to be generous, ways to help, ways to invest? And I've seen how you guys have done that over the Christmas season with all the beautiful gifts you've been able to give to the community and some people in our own church family, the ways you've you've served and helped at shower trailers and food distributions. Will we continue to do that? Will we continue to ask as we enter this new year, God, what needs could I meet? God, what's around me? And this doesn't mean that anytime somebody asks you for something, you have to give them everything you've gotten, be left with nothing, completely impoverished. But no, what it's saying is, it means if people in need ask you for help, give as God leads you. Ask God to speak to you and then respond. What has God called you and I to do when it comes to serving, praying, giving, investing? I saw a beautiful example not too long ago of a person in the grocery store where uh, this older gal did not have the money for her groceries and she's about to put stuff back and somebody just stepped up and just paid for the whole thing. I thought, how beautiful is that? How powerful. And it reminds me of Jesus again. Jesus does not refuse anyone who comes to him. He gives forgiveness and peace and salvation and hope. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he came to the earth like we just celebrated for Christmas. And will we be the same way? Will we be generous like Jesus? 1 Peter 3, 8, 9 puts it this way. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, and tenderhearted. Be humble-minded. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Will you and I, Jesus says, will we respond with him in mind? Will we look at his example and the way he lived and the way he responded and the way he loved? Will we allow this passage of scripture to truly challenge us? To not get vengeance, to not be bitter, but instead to show the overwhelming, loving nature of God. Our response is going to depend on who our greatest love is. And if our greatest love is Jesus, then what he says should supersede everything else we experience. I heard a pastor say to me once these words, said if what you believe contradicts what Jesus teaches, then you need to change, not Jesus. And he was 100% right. He was 100% true. And that's my challenge to you today. Will you and I choose to remember the example of the one we follow, Jesus Christ, and that 
He laid his life down, that he was selfless, that he was kind, that the way he responded was abnormal, that when he was crucified, he allowed that punishment to become our hope and our purpose. He responded in ways that were not normal, and as a result, he changed the world, and he's asking us to do the same. And then secondly, lastly, as we get ready to wrap up, we remember that we live for more than this world. Matthew 5, 11 through 12 says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter, utter, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely in my account. Rejoice and be glad, Jesus says, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Our ultimate hope is not on this earth. Our ultimate hope is in heaven. That's why we can respond differently. Like, well, Jason, but, but, but I can legally respond this way and I have the right to do this. You may have the right, but as a Jesus follower, should you walk in that? Or has God called us to walk in an abnormal response that has the power to transform our culture? You may say, Jason, this is impossible. I can't do this. This is just too much. And I would say to you, I agree with you. We can't. It's impossible for us to do this without the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God in our life. But the beautiful thing is when Jesus came, died, and rose from the dead, the Bible says that when we accept a personal relationship with him, we choose to follow after him, that the same spirit that rose in from the dead now dwells and lives within you and me. And just like Jesus was slapped and he was able to take that slap that led to our salvation, just like he was made to carry a cross that he didn't deserve to carry, just like he was wrongfully convicted and his, his clothes were ripped from his body and taken, just like Jesus does not refuse anyone who comes to him. So he says, I can empower you to have an abnormal response that will change the way in which you view the world you live in. The cross reveals to you and I how God deals with injustice and, and violence. What did he do? He absorbed it and he bore it for us. And as a result, it turned into our greatest victory. Our freedom, your freedom and mine did not come from retaliation, but from an outlandish act of grace and mercy. So today, will we surrender to Jesus' way? Will we surrender to the possibility that he can empower us in a way that only he can to enable us to make a difference? that you and I could choose to have an abnormal response in our interactions with evil people, difficult people, people who are frustrating at times. And as we close, remember, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. I want to finish by reading a short story that I believe illustrates how you and I can respond with Jesus in mind. It's powerful. It's written by a guy named Jared McKenna. It says, I was 18. It was my first year in university studying fine arts. I was coming back on the train and had been reading Martin Luther King Jr. for the first time. I got off at Warwick train station. I was walking over the bypass bridge away from the train station in my typical dreamlike state, Jared says. I thought of Dr. King's talk of nonviolent resistance of the early Christians, and I had hardly noticed the big guy in a dark tracksuit with his sleeves rolled up walking towards me. Still a couple of meters off, he loudly grunted something at me. I missed what he said, a little shocked to, to have my dream world state interrupted. I quickly tried to piece together what he said, and I definitely heard the word money. Thinking he asked for a few bucks to catch the train, I got out my wallet. Bad move. Lunging at me with his fist clenched and another hand reaching for something in his pocket, he yelled, give me your money. He actually said a sentence along these lines with only words I cannot say even in front of my mom or mixed company. At that point, a number of things went through my mind, including some words that I couldn't say in front of you now. A number of things flashed through my head that years later, I began to realize uh, with such clarity. I had the option of flying away or splitting off and taking off or the option of fighting back. I joke about it now, but there was nothing funny at the time. If you've ever been mugged or held up or threatened violently, you know the shock that can be numbing. What next flashed through my head was short-circuited by my panic and crazy split second plan of uh, split right now, run away or hit back. The words of Jesus that Martin Luther King Jr. had been experimenting with said, you have heard that it is said eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, the flash of those words in my imagination felt like warm oil over my head with a tangible sense of this is how God has related to me. For the first time in the situation, I felt grounded, Jared said. I had already gotten out my wallet, so I reached in and gave it to him what I have which was only $10, you'd think that I'd have, he'd known better than to choose an art student as his victim. I'm still not sure why, but I did sim didn't simply hand over the money. 
I stuck out my hand and I said, I'm Jared. Wide-eyed and with his mouth open, he grabbed my hand and grunted, James. Surprised and confused, I said, no, I'm, I'm Jared. To which, with surprise, he matched mine and said, no, my name is James. Oh, I said. There was an awkward pause. This was by far the weirdest passing of the piece that I had been involved with. I noticed his arm in that moment, though. The bruise running along it, interrupted only by the scarring that rivaled the pun like a pincushion. James's arm was offered to me like an icon in Orthodox church service to contemplate the depth of his pain and all the desperate attempts to escape it through drugs. He couldn't have been more than a couple of years older than me, and the next thing that hit me was the stench. Like stale urine mixed with cigarettes, as we stood on the bridge and susp suspended about the freeway, James launched into his life story at a pace that rivaled the cars passing below. His words seemed to overtake each other, then cut each other off. He said he was so sorry for doing this to me, and he was in a bad way, and he'd been doing really well. He was just getting out of a, a drug rehab program and getting off the stuff, but his mom kicked him out of the home again, and now he was back on the streets. I asked him to come by my house and to eat and have a shower, get a change of clothes. I tried to find a new place to stay while he was looking for a new place to stay. Another awkward pause. Then through the middle of us both on the bridge darted a young woman in another black tracksuit with a bag under her arm yelling, go, 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 we gotta go. At that time, I did not know if she'd been hassled by security guards at the train station or if she'd stolen the bag, but it was clear that she knew James and she wanted to get out of there fast. Wait, James, before you go, I shuffled in my backpack past my art gear and textbooks to reach in and grab the title New Testament I was always carrying with me. I got my name and number on there if you ever change your mind about a place to stay. For the first time since I started this uh, big guy's fist, I got an ugly, it got ugly again. James got right up in my face and started yelling, what, what do I want a Bible for? I'm going to hell. His face contorted with anger that had an intensity that explained his arm. Without even thinking, I found myself saying, James, we're all going to hell. That's why Jesus came. Now, I know that that statement rates low on the theological wow scale, maybe embarrassingly high on the theological cringe factor, but it was what I said. What happened next, I think, was one of the weirdest experiences of my life. The big guy, who only moments earlier was ready to beat me up, if not worse, just started crying. I'm not talking about one tier movie crying. He burst out crying like a little kid does. Suddenly, this pain that was so visible in his anger on his scarred arms and in his situation seemed to burst like a floodgate at the news of God's love for him. As the big guy stood there crying, I honestly did not know what to do. In the same way that my response had put him off balance, James' tears now totally threw me. I just stood there while he hung his head and his shoulders heaving and weeping. James didn't say anything more to me. He snorted to try to stop all the snorting and tears. Then he grabbed the Bible and started running. After a few paces, he turned, looked me in the eyes, waved the Bible and nodded. Then he kept running. I stood a long moment on the bridge, stunned. Then I picked up my bag, a bit dazed and confused about what just had happened at the overpass. As I neared the end of the bridge, I saw his female accomplice jump into an already crowded maroon sedan. As she got up, she yelled over the music to the others, I got a bag! James ran up as he got to the car and the music and said, I got a Bible! Then they piled off into the car and I walked right past my bus stop. I just kept walking. James taught me that there is nothing that shows the world what God is like more clearly than when we love our enemies. Despite the reality that throughout the New Testament, the cross is not only how God saves, it's also how we witness to that salvation. I'm aware that enemy love still scandalizes many a fundamentalist and liberal alike. Who wants a savior who loves the enemy we want to kill? Who wants to witness to God, to the God whose love falls like rain on the just and the unjust? Who wants a God who longs to heal those who have hurt us so that they now would hurt more? Who wants a Christ who comes to us in the pain we want to run from? End quote. And that's my challenge to you and I today. Will we respond with Jesus in mind? I believe if we would choose to, like James, that it could change everything. It would change our friendships. It would change estranged relationships. It would change our work environment. It would change our marriage. It would change our community. It would change the way we approach politics and social media posts. It would really change everything. Will you and I today choose to respond with Jesus in mind? And as we walk in an abnormal response, let's believe together as a Christian centered community that we really could see the world transformed by the love of God. So no matter where you find yourself today, whether you are exploring the claims of Christ or you're a Jesus follower, my challenge to you is this, to write out today and to think through how you could react abnormally 
to an opportunity that will come to you in the weeks ahead. When you would normally lash out, when you would normally maybe be frustrated or just run away, what would Jesus want you to respond with that could transform the situation with his love? Because he gives us the beautiful example through his own life and the way he responded to evil. So think about that. Process that. Pray about that. And last but not least, if you're watching right now and you've yet to begin a personal relationship with Jesus, can I encourage you in this moment, would you surrender your life? The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he's in charge, and we believe with our heart that God did raise Jesus from the dead, that he, he died for my sins and mistakes and your sins and mistakes like the story talked about, that if we accept his gift of new life through him, that we become a new creation. The Bible says the old is gone and behold, I make all things new. So right where you're at, if you want to begin a personal relationship with Jesus, would you click that button that says, I commit my life to Christ? And there'll be a little form that you can quickly fill out that we'd love you to fill out so we could follow up with you get to know you a little bit better and help you in your journey with Jesus. We have great resources available. We love you and believe in you. And so my heart's cry and prayer is that you would begin that relationship journey with Jesus today by simply confessing with your mouth that he's Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead for you and that some of the greatest days are going to be ahead. Let me go ahead and close in prayer on our time together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these amazing men and women who are engaging digitally through community right now. I ask, Father, would you help myself? Would you help each of us to respond abnormally, to respond in a way each and every day as we face evil people or difficult situations or hard moments, would we respond in a way that would honor you, that would glorify you, that would please you? And God, would you give us creativity? Would you give us insight into our unique situations and circumstances? We wouldn't just write them off, but Lord, we'd surrender them to you and that you would speak, that you would move, that you would guide and navigate our complexities and that ultimately lead us to a place that would bring transformation, that would bring hope and purpose, that would enable us to walk with peace, God, in difficult situations and not just ignore it, but at the same time that would help those that are walking in an evil way or those that are walking in a difficult manner, that their hearts and minds and lives would be one for you because our response would be different. Our response would be like you, that we'd respond with you in mind, Jesus. And for those that just began a relationship with you, God, would you meet with them? Would you love on them as they connect digitally through community and connect as we begin to get back in person meeting together live? Would you be with them? Would you help them to enjoy this beautiful community you've given us? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you and believe in you. And we look forward to seeing you next week as we continue our series, Kingdom Come.